Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. Today, we're going to talk about power. The Dodge Challenger Hellcat Red Eye comes straight from the factory with 797 horsepower, and it was just announced that the 2020 Ford Super Duty can tow up to 37,000 pounds thanks to a 6.7 liter diesel engine that produces over 1,000 pound-feet of torque. Now, these monster motors beg a really good question. Can you ever have too much power? Is there a point at which cars and trucks are being sold with more power than is safe for the average driver to handle? It's a great question, and returning to the podcast this week are writers Christopher Smith and Anthony Alanis to help me answer it. Thanks for joining me, guys. Glad to be back. More power. Good to be here. That's actually a great reference, Chris, because that's where this kind of uh, macho mythos of never being able to have too much power comes from the toolman Taylor days and always, always, you know, jamming more power than is necessary into something. But you look around and, and it's true today more than ever, because I think we are so deep into this power, this horsepower war and just this power war in general with vehicles that some are beginning to question, and I count myself among them, is it getting out of hand? And as an example, let's take the Dodge Challenger. So I mentioned the Red Eye. That's the one that's currently sold with 797 horsepower straight out of the box. There was also, uh, before the Red Eye, the Dodge Demon. And of course, everybody remembers that as the drag racing special. And that had a little over 800 horsepower uh, right out of the box. So just a little bit more than the Red Eye. But you could do all these things to prep it for drag racing to give it even more power. Uh, I believe like, I believe when you did it, it, it required racing fuel uh, to pop in a new um, computer, um, changing the wheels, uh, and, and a few other things, and you would get 840 horsepower. Um, and then it, and it would be tuned for drag racing. Um, and really, th- it's not a huge difference between 840 and, and, and the low 800s. I don't remember the exact number. But they treated it like unlocking the 840 required so much intentional effort that you you had to really want to do it and be at some place safe, like a, like a drag race uh, strip to Let do it. But what I found crazy was that you could just uh, turn everything back to stock drive off the drag strip and you had still had 808 horsepower, which was an incredible amount of power. Now, um, there are other vehicles that uh, have a lot of horsepower like that. And sometimes they are kind of contained or again, you'd have to do something intentional to activate it, like put it in a a sport mode uh, that maybe takes a few button presses or or menus to go through to get to. Uh, and I kind of like that idea. I like all the, I like like not all that power just being accessible by pushing your right foot down. I like, I like that you might have to go into a menu and say, I want access to all this power because it implies I'm at a place, uh, and a time where it's safe to do so. Um, now, but you're, but you're talking like people have never had high horsepower cars, you know, ever. And I mean, there are people that build their drag cars that that are still street legal all the time, right? True, and we've had high horsepower supercars uh, for a long time as well. Um, but do you? So let me let me ask the question. Um, I've kind of set the stage, and let me go around the table and ask the question: Do you think that you can ever have too much power? Let's just start there, Anthony. What do you think? I think you can, but you can have too much of a lot of things that we seem to be okay with. Um, there are certainly high horsepower cars that often their their price tag limits their accessibility. Um, for the longest time, horsepower required usually a lot of money. Whether it's making your yeah, own six figures, you know, supercars and exotic cars, exactly, or building your own required the money to do so. But you, when you have fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar cars that are making five, six, seven, or even eight hundred horsepower, that puts it in the reach of a lot of people who may have no experience with such power um, or little experience with things of that of that nature and then you run into issues of is it safe well how is the person using it back in the day you either had to earn it by like building the car on your own and, and going after that power in which case you, you probably did know how to handle it if you were um, that mechanically inclined that you could you could build a car like that. Or you had to have money 
And chances are, if you were going to pay six figures back in the day that you were going to treat the car carefully or, or whatever. And, you know, you'd have the, you know, coked up 80s stock trader, sure, wrap his Lamborghini around a tree every once in a while. But in general, you know, if the car is expensive, you're probably going to treat it carefully. I think what's changed is the uh, democratization of horsepower. It has gotten the horsepower wars have made horsepower incredibly, incredibly cheap. And the challenger, I think, is is the the kind of uh, banner car for this. Um, you know, if we look at um, how much challengers cost with that Hellcat engine, it's it's not as much as you would think. I'm looking it up right now. You can start with a Hellcat in like the low to mid sixty thousand range, brand new, and that's and now that's seven hundred and seventeen. Yeah, horsepower. actually, it's uh, the starting price of the Hellcat uh, Red Eye. Oh wait, oh no, you're right. the The Hellcat is sixty six. 60,000 Jesus it's $60,945. Now there's a bunch yeah. bunch of versions of it. There's the Hellcat, the Hellcat wide body, the Hellcat red eye, the Hellcat red eye wide body. So, you know, there <laughs> there's a lot of them, but you can get the basic Hellcat engine for very low 60s. And that's that's insane that that much horsepower is available um per dollar uh these days. Um now, here's one difference I'll point out between 20 years ago or even 10 years ago and now safety systems we have electronic nannies now that even if you put 800 horsepower in a car you have to you would have to turn those nannies off to really get in trouble probably um with traction control and and a whole bunch of other um electronic systems to to keep traction um and to prevent you know uh, leaving your lane and and all of these things um, we didn't have those back then. I mean, when you think about the the Countach from back in the day, it was just an an engine with an accelerator connected directly to the rear wheels. And if you wanted to go fling it off a cliff, it would let you. You know. And nowadays, I feel like there are nannies built into the to cars like the uh, well, really any new car, not just the Challenger, that prevents that a little bit. What about you, Smith? What do you think about just the question? Can you ever have too much power? Oh, boy. I mean, considering the way I started this podcast, you're probably expecting me to say, no, too much is never enough. But yeah, of course, this is getting ridiculous. Of course, this is out of hand. Of course, it's just it's just pure bragging rights. You will never. And and I know I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm going to say this. You will never use 800 horsepower on the street. You might use it at the drag strip. You might use it at a road course. How many people are going to take their cars to the drag strip or the road course? I would like to think that more people will do that than we realize. So, yeah, there, there is such a thing as too much. That being said, the whole issue of being unsafe, I, I, I think that's I think it's just, well, I'll just flat out say it. It's wrong. It's ridiculous. Um, I'm actually looking at stats right now from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. They were and we actually covered this at Motor One um, back earlier in the year. They were trying to say that higher speed limits are potentially causing more deaths, but then the report that they use to support it shows that traffic-related deaths are lower now than they were like 20 years ago, despite having a wide range of cars with crazy horsepower right off the bat. And I think, John, it goes back to what you were saying earlier, and Anthony as well, um, there's there are more safety systems involved that help keep things in check um but as far as as far as it being dangerous i mean there's a reason that young 16 year old drivers have some of the highest insurance rates they're not driving hellcats are they no they're not and i mean to to be (laughs) frank there are fewer and fewer 16 year olds who are even driving so the, the, the car culture at that young young of an age isn't what it used to be where where they're even interested in driving or showing off that way that I, th- well, and, and, the, and, and the point there is you can get in trouble with a, with a 70 horsepower mid eighties Honda civic. You could, but let's be honest well, though. I mean, if you had a 400 horsepower Mustang, it, you could get in trouble a, a lot easier than with the civic. You know, I mean, could you argue the, the point, uh, and maybe this is a, a top tip for all you youngsters out there listening if you go to your parents and argue that, hey, I, I shouldn't have this 70 horsepower mid-80s car, 
um, I should have the 460 horsepower Mustang because the Mustang has all of these safety systems on there that are going to keep me much safer than that Civic that doesn't have anything at all. Well, that's true. If the Civic's just, like just, 20 just years it, old, right? yeah. Um, let me, you know, uh, let me add, let me add another facet to this, which is we, you know, Motor One reviews cars, um, and we review 70 horsepower cars. Well, there's not that many 70 horsepower cars. We review, you know, economy cars with with very little horsepower, and we review supercars. I just had a McLaren 720S a little while ago. Uh, but I've been managing uh, car websites for a long time. And I tell everyone who reviews cars for me, like, we we do not rent a track. Uh, we do not have a track behind our offices, uh, which means we don't have a place to properly um, use all of the capabilities of some of these performance cars we drive. Uh, we usually only have that opportunity when the automaker invites us to drive the car uh, at their facility or at a track they're renting. So I tell everybody, when you are reviewing a car, you are not allowed, and I'm, I'm saying like you're forbidden, you're forbidden to use them on the road in an irresponsible way. Uh, it, we, it is not our job to test the performance limits of cars on public roads. I think that's incredibly dangerous and irresponsible and puts a lot of innocent people at risk uh, for really the, the entertainment of us writing a review and, and hopefully people enjoy reading it. It's just not worth it. Instead, I tell people we review cars like we owned them, like we lived with them for a week and we're using them in our daily lives. And that means if we have a McLaren, I'm going to take it to the grocery store and I'm going to take it out to dinner and I'm going to do that. And of course, I'm going to dip into the throttle on a highway entrance, and but I'm going to do all of that judiciously and carefully and, and never really explore the insane limits of something like a McLaren on public roads. Um, because I think, and, and what you just said is, is true, Smith, is that something like 800 horsepower, you're never going to use it on the street. And if you are, you're being wildly reckless. Uh, because that's not what it's made for. Really, what we're talking about, I think, in these super high horsepower cars like the Challenger, that they're not supercars. They're not rare. They're not exclusive. And they're not so purpose built that they would be terrible as a daily driver. The Challenger is just a normal car. I mean, it's absolutely a daily driver. You could be doing everything with that car. And it's we've just never had that before where you could put you could get 800 horsepower in a daily driver and i think that's to me the 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 scary part is that there's there's this this incredible uh uh capability that isn't just trotted out on weekends when you're taking your supercar to the racetrack it's under your right foot at all times and the only thing protecting you are what the automaker puts in as the safety systems uh and hopefully your own common sense Right. And, uh, and you know, it's really a testament to just the technological revolution that we've seen in automobiles in the last, I'll, I'll say, 20 years or so. Once upon a time, the only way to get that really big power was to build an engine that was really a race engine. And we're talking big cams, big noise, something that the normal person wouldn't want to deal with every day. The way computers have just revolutionized how we can make horsepower. Yeah. You could have those 800 horsepower engines that are still completely docile around town and livable. So it, it, it's, it's opening up a whole new realm. Um, and I think it's great. Is, is it ridiculous? Hell yes, it's ridiculous. But you know what? That's, a, that's part of the wonders of living. And as long as people are still responsible with it, and you know, a lot of that, it's going back to the automakers as well for offering really good safety systems that help keep these things in check. And I think for the most part, when you buy a, a big 800 horsepower Challenger or like the new the 760 horse Shelby, I think the people that are buying those cars most of them anyways, are recognizing that I better keep these safety systems on unless I'm at a track or unless I go to some special racing event where somebody shows me exactly what I've gotten myself into. I would hope so. But the, the more of them you sell, you know, the, the more statistics just play a hand and, you know, somebody's going to turn turn something off and 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 do something they shouldn't. Um, but but yeah, I, I hope that's not the case. Let me let me um, also bring in 
an interesting development, I think, in this is that some automakers do a really good job, I think, of policing themselves. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples. The first is Volvo. Uh, Volvo recently announced that uh, starting, I think, with 2020 or 21, they're going to limit the top speed of all of their cars to 112 miles an hour. Uh, which was kind of out of the blue. Nobody asked them to do it. Nobody legislated them uh, to do it. Uh, but I think they recognized that kind of anything above that is like what you said, Smith, is kind of just for bragging rights and show and is unnecessary. Uh, 112, I think, gives you enough power to get out of trouble if you ever needed to, but not to the point where you're driving faster than you can uh, you can control without special training. Um what do you think of that, Anthony? Do you think is that's something that's always struck me as odd that we have cars on the road that can go 150 miles an hour, but what are you going to use that for on the road? Uh, Volvo seems to agree with that. Is that something, do you think that should be across the board or or is having 180 miles at your dispo- 80 miles an hour at your disposal um, a good thing? Well, I think it depends on what you're buying the vehicle for. If you're buying a performance car specifically to hit the track on the weekend, well, then, of course, you don't want the, the speed restricted. But on public roads, I'm surprised more automakers don't set lower um, top speeds. We could even have, with GPS systems, we could even have a system where top speeds uh, can't be unlocked until you're physically located at a place that they can be used like a track or something like that. Um, you know, technology can do all of that, uh, these days, but you know, people get into a discussion about curbing personal freedoms of like, you know, if, if we can, if they can sell a car that goes 150 miles an hour, I should be able to buy one that goes 150 miles an hour, even though it's illegal to use it anywhere, uh, but a track. Um, I mean, yeah, that's that's really treading the uh, that's really treading the line there. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the that's I mean, not that, the that's, America that's you want to live in. Different, yeah. That's a completely different podcast. That's probably not for Motor One. Well, I mean, but it's true though. There there are no laws um, against offering as much power as an automaker wants to offer, and there's no law that a driver has to be trained to use a high horsepower car. So this is where, as horsepower becomes cheaper. I think the danger level rises and the only thing keeping it at bay right now are electronic safety systems. And the question is to me, how easily those systems can be turned off. Like I remember, remember the GT 500 from a generation or two ago, uh, kind of had a really bad reputation of being um, a very difficult car to handle. And I always got the impression that was because it had so much power and the traction control was so easy to turn off. Um, And that, is what created uh, a lot of situations where people were driving them without any electronic nanny and the cars could just break loose so easily with all that power. Um, I, I think that showed me that it like, it really makes sense to um, make people go through an intentional process to turn off those safety systems so that it's not you, so that you can't just be at a stoplight and be like, off and then you know take off and and floor it and possibly end up sliding off the road i don't see that that i just i no that's that's just silly i mean if people are going to use the power they're going to use the power making them go through a couple extra steps isn't going to curb anything um i actually had a lot of experience with that previous generation gt500 i think i I mean my impression was it's just it didn't have a very good suspension system well it could be that too solid solid axle solid axle notwithstanding right um it it just it just ford didn't dial it in as good as they should have but that that still doesn't change the fact that even i mean i have a mustang right now that's like 230 horsepower and and i can spin that thing at will whether it's 400 500 horsepower it, it again it's 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 not necessarily any different than it was before. People can still get into trouble. You can still slide out. You can still have accidents. Um, I don't think the increase in horsepower is really changing that. Uh, it's. I mean, we're seeing more horsepower in everything. So it's just a case of people adapting to what they have. And, and really, I mean, the statistics even back that up. We have more horsepower than we ever have. Traffic fatalities are lower. That's true. So... So I mean it's it's the safety systems and I I and maybe it's naive of me but I still think there's th- this overriding 
fact of nature that people want to, I don't know, survive. <laughs> so if if they're behind the wheel of a high horsepower car, I'm giving most people the benefit of the mm. doubt that they're not going to be See, I extremely think, stupid. I, I think people do have a uh, will to survive, but they're also inherently stupid. <laughs> like, and that they, I mean, people think they're invincible or people, th- people overestimate their own abilities. Like, yeah, they want to survive, but they're, they also have a lot of other motivations going on inside them. You know, I, I mean, I think a bigger concern isn't horsepower, but maybe a, uh, you know, vehicle inspections, people are running around on terrible tires. Well, there's, um, you, know, you know, you made you made a reference to the Lamborghini Countach. You know, there was no traction control or any any systems systems back then, but it had freaking steamroller tires. So you could actually roll on the gas and use all of that power and it wouldn't slip. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you take and, and you shrink the tires down by half, now all of a sudden you have a car. Do it on anything. Do it on. Well, I mean, my Mustang, for example. I have good tires, but they're not super tires. That's one of the reasons why it uh, it spins like it does. It's maybe that's where we should be concentrating our our efforts instead of going after horsepower. Or looking at horsepower, uh, what other things are making cars dangerous? And not only sure. that, but what about driver training too? It's number one piecemeal across the United States, and in some places completely inadequate. I remember my driver training uh, from what was it now, fifteen, sixteen years ago. Oh, I mean. They didn't even check the test scores before they approved us. They just gave us the yeah. slip. <laughs> and I know who I was with, with in that class, and that's frightening to me. I'm just passing people. Well, that that's frightening uh, for driving a normal Honda Civic, let alone a performance car. Like, like, yeah, we barely teach our young people how to drive, period, let alone how to drive either offensively or defensively or in a, in, in a high-performance situation. Um, so yeah, that's, that's absolutely terrifying. I want to take John Neff's offensive driving course. Yeah. I need to know more <laughs> about that. It's just driving around swearing at people. <laughs> that's all it is. Uh, no, haven't you ever heard of like offensive driving? Like, like it's, it's like where you're like scanning and you're, you're, you're heightened attention levels so that you can, um, John, I, I think that's defensive driving, John. Offensive driving is I, where you're attacking the other guy. Well, no, I, let me, let me look it up. Let me, let me do it. <laughs> I mean, I had an offensive driving car club back in high school, but it, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing defensive about it. You're right. I did mean just defensive driving, but there is offensive driving in the world of truck driving. It's not about actually running other people off the road. It, it's about not just reacting to what's around you, anticipating, but staging. Yeah. But I guess that is defensive driving. Yourself. That is defensive driving. Yeah. But let's let's talk about. Um, um, driver training from manufacturers because I really look favorably on manufacturers that sell high performance vehicles that also offer high performance driver training uh, along with it. And I'll give you uh, a few examples because there's actually a lot. Like Ford has the Raptor Assault uh, driver school, the GT350 track attack. Uh, they used to have the ST Octane Academy. I don't know if they still have that. And the RS Adrenaline Academy. So they had like they had like a special school for every high performance car they sold. Acura has an NSX dynamic drive experience. There's the BMW M drivers program. Cadillac used to have a V Performance Academy. Um, and the list goes on. Uh, Mercedes AMG Driving Academy. I really like that. I, I, I think that should be offered more or even included with the purchase price of some of the, the really high high horsepower cards. Um, you know, it's not mandatory. Nobody's making them do it. But I think if, if I were buying one of these cars, knowing my I, I don't have a particularly high level of performance driving training, I would absolutely want to learn that about my specific car in the right uh, environment. A thousand times this, Anthony, you were spot on with uh, driver training programs. I think they've gotten better in recent years. It's been a while since I was in mine, obviously. Um, but th- there's woefully not enough done especially when it comes to emergency maneuvers emergency situations and i mean to be honest that's where you really need to be aware and to step up it's easy to get into a car put it in drive and just drive down to the corner store it's when things are getting out of hand if you go into a skid how do you how do you handle it how do you respond and also just training yourself to not do that initial knee-jerk ah reaction which helps absolutely nobody and having manufacturers step up with these driving schools, absolutely. Every manufacturer that sells a high-performance car should offer some sort of training to help people drive it, if for no other reason than to just make themselves look good. But you're also going to be making 
drivers across the country better. And since we're talking about the Challenger so much, uh, there is a Challenger Hellcat driving school. Uh, it's put on by uh, Bondurant uh, Racing School in Arizona. And not only do they do general high performance uh, driver training for the Hellcat, they also have a specific uh, drag racing class as well. So there's there's even uh, training for that car too. The last, the last thing I want to touch on about is um, when trying to answer, can you ever have too much power, is talking about um, when it's not about speed. And like I mentioned at the beginning, the Ford Super Duty for 2020 can tow 37,000 pounds, which is almost hard for me to like f- imagine in my head what you could tow that is that heavy. Uh, you know, I think of large uh, travel trailers or tiny homes that are like 15,000 to 20,000, but like I have no idea how you'd get up to 37,000 pounds in some cases. I know it's perfectly possible, but. Um, that is a, an incredible amount of, of weight. And the crazy thing is that you don't need a commercial driver's license to tow that much if you've got a Super Duty. Just like you don't need a commercial driver's license to drive a 40-foot RV that's on a bus chassis. Like, there's no special training required by law to drive either of those, and yet they do require... Uh, skill and training to learn how to do safely. It, do you, do you see a difference between that uh, type of high horse or high power situation and high performance cars, or do you think it's the same thing? Where if you've got it, use it, and and it's up to the person. Actually, John, I think um, I think you do need a CDL to go above twenty six thousand pounds. I'm not entirely sure on that because i'm not a big towing pro um i th- i think above twenty six thousand pounds whether it's commercial or just personal use you do need some sort of training but still twenty six thousand pounds to just the average joe if you've never towed anything before um and and anybody who's towed large loads i've, I've towed some pretty big loads before you realize right away that it's not just hey i get in this and go it, it requires a whole different mindset I would have to agree. The, the only time I've towed was when I towed uh, uh, an older Mustang I had that broke down behind like an old, I think it was a Suburban. And as soon as I got in that driver's seat, everything changed in terms of how that vehicle reacted. And that could be a lot for somebody to tackle on the road for the first time. Yeah, you're. I, I just looked it up. You're right. It's 26,000 pounds and you need a CDL. Um, but I also, I've also read places... Uh, where, you know, we're talking about different types of towing too. There's the kind where you're towing behind the trailer and then there's the kind where you're connecting the trailer to the truck in the bed, either uh, by a gooseneck uh, hitch or or a fifth wheel hitch. Um, so, and the, and the gooseneck and fifth wheel can tow, those are the ones that can tow up to 37,000. I think if you're doing it just behind the truck, I think they usually top out around 20,000 or so and, and they say you shouldn't do more than that. Um, but man, yeah, I, I, I have, um, I haven't done a lot of towing, but I have driven a lot of RVs and it's a different thing, but, uh, I, I don't know if I've mentioned before, but my family happens to own an RV rental company in, in Ohio where we live. And one thing that we used to see, cause we used to have the, the company, uh, the shop where it is in kind of a, a tight area like and and we'd be renting these giant 40 foot rvs to people and they don't require special training and so we would do a walk around and try to explain everything to them and how they drive as best we could and this happened more often than you would think like probably five times a year the person wouldn't make it out of the parking lot without hitting something and then immediately have to bring it back and ruin his vacation because they didn't realize, oh, the rear end swings out 10 feet or, or you know, I'm sitting ahead of the front wheels when I'm turning. And it's really, and I believe me, when I've driven RVs on the highway, every semi-truck driver is 100% aware that every RV driver is not trained to drive their vehicle. And they, you just, you get looks, you get, you know, you, 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 and most, most RV drivers are probably not aware of the fact that these semi drivers hate them, but yeah, they don't know how to drive a vehicle that large. Uh, and it can be dangerous when they're not paying attention or doing what they should. Um, I, I actually think it would be good for certain size RVs to require a, 
a maybe not a CDL, but at least some uh, not like you know non commercial training for large vehicles. Um, I mean, I think there absolutely should be um, increased steps to uh, to license people to train people for these larger vehicles. I come from a family of truck drivers, John, so I know exactly what you are talking. But about. But you don't. You, but you wouldn't agree that there should be some type of extra license requirement for, let's say, vehicles that have over five hundred horsepower. No, because we're, we're, we're talking about apples and, and oranges here. If you don't want to use that 500 horsepower, all you got to do is be a little judicious with your foot. If you're towing 37,000 pounds, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You can be as safe as possible. And you may not realize that when you go to hit the brakes, you're going to you're gonna need 10 times the stopping distance. Hopefully, you figure that out if you're towing something that I don't know, heavy. man. When I'm- it's, I mean, it's, 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 an, it's an inherent thing versus a choice the horsepower uh, and like we said it earlier modern cars the way they make horsepower they can be docile daily drivers but see i there's i think your argument only stands when you're talking about high performance cars versus rvs rvs are inherently large you can't do anything about that but with a super duty you don't have to be towing 37 pounds thousand pounds uh you don't have to be towing anything it's okay. So how is that? But how is that more dangerous than just driving a regular Super Duty that, that doesn't have that capability or an older Super Duty? Because it has the capability to do 37,000 pounds. But it, but how is that capability going to make you any more dangerous than somebody in, say, a 10 year old Super Duty? Well, because the 10 year old Super Duty is going to have a lower maximum tow rating. But if you're not but if you're not towing anything, I, maybe maybe we're miscommunicating here. If you're not towing anything, what's the difference? Just I mean, just having the capability doesn't make it more dangerous, does it? Well, in the case of the Super Duty the, duty though, you could create a license that says anybody could drive a Super Duty, but you can only tow over X amount of pounds. And we do kind of have that with the CDL. Um, right. But I don't know. I don't, but we don't have that with high performance cars. So if we require it for the super duty, why don't we require it for the high performance car? Well, I mean the super duty there's, I guess if we're going to talk about it this way, there's only that inherent danger when you're actually towing something that big. I see what you're talking about with the, with the high horsepower cars, the inherent danger is always there under your foot, but it's in, in my mind, it's a lot more manageable. You have to be completely aware when you press the pedal in that high horsepower car, you have to know exactly what you're doing. In the Super Duty, when you're towing, you can have the best intentions and just not have any experience towing. You, do, do, do you see what I'm getting at? I don't at? know. I, I think that's there, more there's, there's similar the, than, than you're making it out to be. The, there, there's, the, there's the intent to use all of that horsepower for grins and giggles, if you will, right. versus just the innocent dude trying to tow a heavy load that's never done it before. Oh, see, I don't think that's, I don't that, think that's that's where that's where the danger. I don't is. think their intention matters. Like like the fact that one is towing and the other is just for fun. Like I don't think that that makes a difference. Um, I, I I don't think that's a salient difference. I mean, it is a difference, but I don't think it's salient to whether or not somebody should be licensed to use a machine with that much capability. Um, you know, I think well. I, I guess maybe it maybe comes down like this. If you look at it this way, we're talking recreation versus profession. And oh, but and I don't think you can. I don't think you can say towing twenty six thousand of over twenty six thousand pounds is always a commercial endeavor. No, it, it it's not. But is there anybody out there that's going to get into their their super duty and just tow thirty seven thousand pounds for the fun of it? Yeah, no. they're gonna they're gonna take their thirty seven thousand pound boat or something. Somewhere. What boat are they towing that weighs? I don't know. That's the thing. I don't know pounds. what weighs thirty-seven thousand pounds. But, but, I, I mean, there's, there's, there's the bigger issue there. That I mean, one, you need to have, you do need to have a license to tow that much. Two, how many people are actually going to tow thirty-seven thousand pounds? I but mean, it could it's be, certainly it a bragging. Could be, it, it's a bragging right. Uh, I, I mean, honest, just, just like the big horsepower, it's a bragging. Towing, right. towing is dangerous at eight thousand pounds or five thousand yeah. pounds. So, it, it's oh, it's, it's very dangerous. Thirty-seven thousand pounds isn't even the the mark that we're saying and it's not even the 26,000 pounds that requires a CDL you know I, I'm talking you go down all the way to just small trailers and people should be trained because towing can be difficult and dangerous so um so well you you just you just made my argument for me right there I don't think I did there, there's there's <laughs> there's much more inherent danger 
towing a vehicle versus driving a car with high horsepower. There's much more inherent danger. Mm. I see what you, I, 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 I see with, what you with, mean, with, but... I, I think it's all. I think it's a matter power. of degree because you still have that. Um, it, even if you have all the nannies turned on, if you have an 800 horsepower car, you can get in a lot of trouble. Like the nannies aren't that strong that they're going to keep you in between two two yellow lines and four wheels on the ground and you know not hitting anybody else. Um, you know that much horsepower will let you get into trouble if you want to. Let let me put it to you this way. How would you feel more comfortable on the road next to somebody in a, a challenger demon that's never driven anything above 400 horsepower in their life or next to somebody in a super duty towing an aircraft carrier that's never towed anything in their life. Well, I know which car I would feel more comfortable next to. And that's literally impossible. That's a, a tough, uh, <laughs> I, I know which car I feel next to. Uh, well, I actually, I'd feel more comfortable next to the super duty because he wouldn't be going anywhere. <laughs> towing a, an yeah, but he carrier. also wouldn't have also wouldn't be able to stop. Um, if, if you happen to come up on a turn, you know, he might turn into you, not realizing that the turn radius I'm taking is you literally different. that it would be an aircraft carrier. So if we, well, okay, if that, we that's change, a if we change the, tr- change the truck to an aircraft carrier, he wouldn't be going Let's, let's, let's shrink it down to, we'll just say something modest, like a 40 foot yacht. How's that? Yeah. Um, I, uh, to, literally to be honest and, and, and it maybe, uh, I shouldn't say this, but if I looked over and it was a 17 year old kid driving the challenger, uh, as opposed to a middle-aged guy driving the truck, I'd probably be more nervous next to the teenager. Well, okay. We're not, not now we're qualifying the drivers. So it, has it become now not a case of horsepower and, and pulling power being dangerous? Are we now talking about experience? I don't think it's ever been about the actual power figure, just that people don't know how to use what they can get their hands on. Yeah, people it's, people are being given access to machines uh, that have so much higher envelopes of performance, whether it be uh, something like towing or, or speed, that they have no requirement of having any training to use. That's the issue. There's something to be said for that, absolutely. But I think we're still talking about much more inherent danger in a vehicle that can tow a large load because now it's not just about blipping the throttle and spinning out. Now you have to think about actually trying to stop the thing. You have to think about actually trying to turn the thing. We're but here's, the, here's the thing. Aspects of the driving process. I, I, like, like there, there already are some laws governing who can and can't tow large weights. Mm-hmm. So we agree. We agree that that's a good thing. And I might argue, and maybe you'd agree that uh, there should be even more um, requirements for training for towing down to lower weight amounts. Um, but we're disagreeing on the fact that even if there's a difference in degree of danger uh, between a high high horsepower vehicle versus a high uh, a, a vehicle with high towing. That we're, we're disagreeing that there should be any extra driver training required for the high per, for driving the high performance vehicle. That I guess uh, to that end, I would always like to see more driver training. I mean, that's never a bad thing, whether it's a high horsepower car or not. Um, the I mean, way back in the day, I had a a, so, a small autocross course um, with an instructor in an old '89 Ford Taurus show. That car is not high horsepower, but I learned so much from that. It's kept me, it, it kind of opened my eyes to just, you know, how how awesome I really wasn't, even though I thought I was. So any level, more training is always good. I, I You're kind of talking about should should people be required to go through, should, should there be licenses before you get a higher horsepower car? It's no, because the inherent danger isn't the same as towing. You know, it, it reminds me of uh, our video games, our driving video games. Like, you know, remember back in the day with Gran Turismo, you had to earn the licenses in order to get the, the, the more powerful cars. Like, we had it in our video games, but we don't have it in real life. Um, yeah, well, uh, well, that's... Yeah, you're talking about a video game. I know. I know. I, well, I you mean, were talking about an aircraft carrier, so... <laughs> 
Oh, and, and we do have we do have steps to go through before you can get a license to drive in real life. Well, and we've already if established you want to those go are... racing. We... But but if you want to go racing in various in various racing series, you have to qualify to get licenses there too. If you want to go drag racing, that's true. It, like if you want to be an official NHRA, the problem uh, is drag racer, the, the... you have to get different. You have to be certified at different speeds. The problem is the cars we're selling for use on the street now are race cars. I mean, they are so high horsepower that they are faster, quicker uh, than than not only race cars of 20 years were, but but a lot of them are faster and quicker than race cars today. Uh, as you know, I mean, you look at um, some of the I forget what racing series I'm thinking of, but the the actual race car has less power than the production car uh, in some cases, um, which is why I am totally supportive of automakers stepping up and. And not just offering it has an extra fee. You know what? If you're selling an 800 horsepower car, you should give that person just some basic driver's training. If nothing else, just to help them understand, hey, you have to be like legit careful with this thing. You have to you have to look at curves completely differently because if you're on a road and you see a curve a quarter mile away and you think, oh, I'll roll on the gas in your 800 horsepower car, as soon as you roll on the gas, you're there. Yeah, I'm pr- so yeah, I absolutely support that. I'm pretty sure that Ford created the the Raptor Assault School to teach its owners that you can't just jump the truck off of anything. <laughs> that what? you can't do thirty foot jumps. Right, right. Like they were getting too many bent frames back, and they're like, look, look, people, you, you, it can jump, but you can't just, just, you know, take a bobcat and create a jump in your backyard and launch it off it. Like it needs to be a little bit more controlled than that. Um, so, on- but it, but it's his. As far as extra licensing, though, to use that extra horsepower, I mean, there are already laws that limit how fast you're supposed to go on the street. I, I mean, if people are out breaking the laws, in theory, they're going to get busted, right? Kind of going back to yeah, the global limiting its top speed to 112. I, that, that's stupid. If you're going to limit your speed, why don't you limit the speed to like 80 or 85 or 90? Uh, I mean, there are some places in the U.S. where you can drive 85 on, on the on the highway. If you're If you're really concerned about safety... Crashing at 100 miles an hour is probably going to kill you. It doesn't um, matter if you're doing 112. Yeah, yeah. I well, I, I, I would, I would like to ask Volvo why they chose 112 because um, that seems very specific. You know, not 110, not 100. Um, and, but I, I see their point as as kind of being the one you're making as like they're they're only going to give you enough speed that you need. Uh, that, that you can legally use on the roadway and then need in an emergency, but they're not going to give you enough speed to just play around. Uh, but you can't use 112 legally on the roadway, right? There's no place. In no, the but United I think. Where you can but use it legally but on the road. To, to be realistic, a you can never peg the speed limit of your car to the speed limit on the road because nobody drives 65 miles an hour. They always drive 70 or 75. So if you take that and you say, okay, well the fastest speed limit is 85. And if people are going to do five more than that, and that's going to be 90. So you're, you're already up to a top speed of 90, right? So I don't know why they went another 22 miles an hour above that. Uh, but I think that's what they were going for was they're going to give you, uh, you know, I'm trying to think, is there, would there ever be a reason to need to go above 100 miles an hour? Like if you are trying to pass somebody or, or I, I don't know. That's why I want to ask Volvo why they picked 112. Um, I, I mean, I, I can think of a reason. I can think of all kinds of reasons to, to go as absolutely as fast as possible. But, you know, it's a question of balancing whatever you need to do versus give me, safety. Give me one reason why you would need to go 150. Um, let's see. On a public road. Wife, wife is presently dying in the passenger seat and the hospital is 10 miles away on the highway. I would, I would go as fast as possible to get there. Sure, but also keep in mind that if an ambulance picked up your wife, it doesn't have the capability to go 150 miles an hour. Right, but they also have doctors on board that can help right there. True. Or EMTs on board. True. I don't know. And, I, they, also, to, to, and they also don't have a personal connection to the person in the passenger seat. Well, and, 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 honestly, I can, if, and I can think of all kinds of situations in a car where there might be some kind of emergency where, hey. Right, where there's a life at we, stake. We, we've got to get there now. Right. I don't know. It, maybe it's... It, Maybe it, that's it'll probably Volvo's. never happen, but maybe that's Volvo's reason for 112. They like, well, we wanted a we wanted a speed that like if you needed to get there faster than normal, 
but maybe honestly, they picked it because you know they they determined that anything above 112 becomes just inherently dangerous for the average driver. I see it more as just a just a PR thing. Volvo wants to try to to advertise maybe, but more, I don't see more, Volvo more like safety. That. So I mean, so the, this 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 seems kind of. Uh, I mean, keep in mind, Volvo is also talking about putting cameras in its cars that watch drivers, which that that's a whole other level of a uh, of creepy right there. At, and I'm not saying Volvo isn't concerned about safety. I mean, they've been one of the safest car companies for pretty much ever. Um, but but that 112 mile an hour thing, it I just it gave me the impression that it was more of a PR grab. That hey, in this era of cars that can that can do well, in the era of hypercars that are trying to set 300 mile an hour speed records, and and zero to 400 kilometers an hour to zero records. We're going to be the sensible company and only let you go 112. But I don't know. I, Volvo, the, the fine print, 112 will still kill you pretty quickly. Well, I mean, so will 65. But yeah. But um, Volvo has never struck me as a company that would do something like that, especially when it comes to safety. It, it, when it comes to safety with Volvo, it seems like they're legit. Like they're genuinely trying to make the safest cars on the road and they've got the crash test to prove it. They have the history of safety innovation to prove it. Um, were they the ones who invented the seatbelt? Volvo um, yeah. gave away the patent for uh, the seatbelt because they thought it was more important that lives be saved than, than they have an exclusive safety innovation. Um, oh, no, no question that Volvo is interested in safety. I mean, they, they always have. Um, but if they were interested in safety, why why 112 miles an hour why not yeah 80? what if it's, all right well i'm gonna why not 85 i was gonna you know? say what if it's yeah. 112 now and then in 2025 it's 90 like what if this is a step towards <laughs> maybe slowly reining in because eventually with technology and autonomous vehicles which are still a ways away but that those safety systems are going to restrict drivers more and more on what they can do and where they can do it. I mean, it's well, maybe, but they could also, I mean, autonomous driving could open up even higher speeds because the computer can safely operate uh, better than a human can uh, at those speeds. And maybe they can do it in a group of cars and like, so So who knows? I mean, autonomous driving may actually increase speeds. I mean, it may, Uh, I mean, it'll definitely, I think it'll do that, but it takes out that human driver element too. That makes a lot of what we're talking about. uh, The, the the main variable at least is the, yeah, is that all right well i don't think uh i don't think we're gonna align our views completely but at least we have a to-do item a task we're gonna go to volvo and ask why 112 miles an hour because now it's bugging me and i have to know um all right we had some other uh really big news this week um the debut of the 2020 Corvette convertible uh, happened this week, and uh, this is pretty exciting because the Corvette Coupe debuted in July, and it was one of the biggest, most exciting debuts, uh, not only of the year, but like of our generation, uh, because this was the switch to uh, from front engine to mid engine, and now we get to see how that is applied uh, to a convertible. Um, Chris, you wrote up our debut article about the convertible, so tell us the salient points about what's uh, what's new with the uh, the Corvette convertible? Right, I mean it's debuting. Well, actually, it will have already debuted by the time the podcast comes out. It, it's set to debut on Wednesday, and I mean there aren't a lot of surprises. We've seen spy photos, and GM even teased the uh, the convertible with the top down back in July. I mean the the crux of it, obviously, this is a folding hardtop. It's not just the uh, the removable roof that you can take out of the Stingray, and it's also, I mean, this is technically another banner moment for Corvette. Because there's never been a retractable power hardtop. It's always been a soft top. So this is the first in that aspect. It's a pretty slick arrangement. It's a two-piece top that can fold in 16 seconds. Uh, you can fold it. It speeds up to 30 miles an hour. To do it all, Chevrolet had to redesign the engine cover. So it doesn't have quite that same snazzy-looking engine cover that the coupe has. Um, but in in response, you get what I think is just a really cool dual nacelle tonneau cover that uh, sits over it all. And uh, I think, I mean, compared to previous Corvettes where you've had just the coupe and then you've had the convertible that's kind of had the same look. This with the, uh, with the nacelles and that tonneau cover gives it a completely different look. Um, Big thing too, with the top completely stowed, 
it actually sits over top the engine and uh, GM, they've put more vents in there to help make sure the engine stays cool. It doesn't block any of the C8's uh, storage compartments. So either that's crazy. That. That's a, that's actually, it's funny because um, I read the press release and Chevy said you can still put two, uh, two full size golf bags in yep. the, the trunk, which is hilarious because they're really pushing this fact that it can hold two <laughs> golf really bags. Are. And I don't think it's a good thing to push. Like, like it's just admitting outright our customers are very old and are only going to be driving the Corvettes to uh, their country clubs. Um, but that's kind of amazing that it doesn't sacrifice any of the of the cargo space. I And I may be in the minority. I think it looks better than the coupe. I don't miss the see-through engine cover at all. Uh, I think it looks g- great with both the top up and especially with the top down. It looks more it exotic does. to me. I don't think you're going to be in the minority once people see this, John. I think it looks. I think it looks just just freaking awesome. Uh, GM said that they they were inspired by aircraft with their tonneau design, and it. Just, I mean, it it doesn't look like a fighter jet, but it just it just kind of has this cool, um, almost like a maybe like a '60s kind of interceptor thing going. You know, back when uh, when manufacturers were doing all kinds of prototypes with jet names and they had like fins and it, it just kind of gives a little bit of that vibe, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and did you already mention the price? Uh, I did not. Um, it's going to be $7,500 more than the base LT1. So we're still, we're still talking about a bang for buck hard top convertible supercar here. That should put it right around $67,000. They didn't list a specific price in the release. They just said that it would be 7,500 more than the base uh, one LT coupe, man. I mean, and, that's uh, that was production. Pr- production is a uh, is set to to start here later this year and go on sale early next. Uh, the huge news about the coupe was the starting price uh, under fifty nine yeah. nine nine fifty nine nine nine. That in- but that included destination. That included destination. Yeah, which is crazy. And and so to have the convertible only be seven and a half thousand dollars more, I think at this price is a steal. You're always going to pay more for a convertible. A lot more engineering goes into it. Uh, so uh, a seven and a half thousand dollar markup for the convertible, I would pay that uh, any day, any day. And to me, again, at that price, you look at the Acura NSX, which to me feel it feels like the most direct competitor. Um, the the NSX starts at uh, uh, well above one hundred and fifty thousand, and there's no convertible, and it's like, man, when this thing comes out, I, I it, it's it's all going to be about production. It's all going to be about how many they can produce. Are they going to produce as many as people want, or are they going to limit it and really keep that demand up? So we'll see markups and things like that, because that's what makes me fear that none of these are actually going to cost sixty, seventy thousand. They're all going to cost a hundred thousand plus because of the dealer markups. Well, there, there certainly are going to be some dealers that do markups out there. And we actually did a story at uh, Ed Motor One um, talking about Corvette enthusiasts really mobilizing and in some ways public shaming yeah, public dealers shame. that are that are trying to get over MSRP. And when you look at, at some of the forums online, I mean, there, there's a pretty good running list of dealers that have said right out, hey, we're going to sell this at MSRP. And then other dealerships that I suspect haven't commented, but people have reported, yeah, they're trying to get 20 or 30 grand. So, I mean, in the grand scheme of things, I think, um, it, provided they don't sell out, you have a pretty good chance of going out and getting one of these cars at that at that base price. Oh, and uh, another thing, Usually Corvettes add extra weight. We don't know how much weight has been added. Uh, Chevrolet hasn't told us this, but we are told that um, it doesn't compromise performance at all. And you can still get the Z51 package. So you can still go 0 to 60 in 2.9 seconds. And to kind of dovetail on our discussion, it's only a 495 horsepower car, but it's getting to 60 in under 3 seconds. Do we, yeah, do we exactly. Need to have a special, do we need to have a special license by a Corvette now? Yeah, you need a, a Corvette license. Now I'm just poking you in the eye. I, it's, it's, we're moving on. Just for the Corvette. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, I'm excited. Uh, I hope we get to drive it soon. I know um, they're just starting to get out and get into the hands of some journalists to drive. So we're going to get our chance behind the wheel and let everyone know uh, what the Corvette is like. And, and now we'll add the convertible to the list. 
All right. Well, um, we'd love to hear what you think about both our discussion about whether or not you can have too much power as well as about the Corvette convertible. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Our handles are at motor one com. Uh, and the discussion will continue there. And of course, on our website, like Chris said, we write about all this stuff. Uh, we have many articles on both the Corvette and all the high horsepower cars that you can dream of. And coming up, we're going to find out what we've all been driving this week. Uh, before the break, though, I want to remind you that if you're listening to this online, you can get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So hit the subscribe button wherever you like listening to podcasts. Welcome back. Uh, during this part of the show, we talk about what cars we're driving this week. And today we're going to start with you, Chris. What are you driving this week? This week, I'm getting ready for winter in uh, Western South Dakota with my 1995 Ford Mustang GT convertible because it's the best winter car ever. <laughs> it's, it's 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 not really. Um, but you know what? I, I've I, With a good set of snow tires, and I have a good set of snow tires, um, and I put a little bit of extra ballast in the trunk just for a little extra traction, there's really no place I can't go unless really? I'm that crazy, seems, crazy off-road. That seems like not only the worst car for winter, but the worst location for winters as well. That seems like like <laughs> a place that gets it's, four it's, feet of snow and it's, it's a rear-wheel really drive convertible. I, I mean, it, it's really not. Um, the, my area of the Black Hills, kind of the southern hills, well, central southern hills, it's known as the banana belt. So we might get a cold blast, and then a couple days later, it'll warm up and melt. Um, if I if I was living actually up in the hills, you know, five six thousand feet, yeah. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd have something all wheel drive because I'd be navigating some some pretty sketchy roads. But I mean, honestly, I, I bought a Mustang convertible several years ago. Um, just has a joke to write about has a winter car uh, because I, I I was doing some just some writing on the side back then, and I thought what'll be a fun hilarious car to write about trying to drive through winter, and I got a ninety two LX five liter convertible. And I put a set of, of Nokian snow tires on it, and I put a couple bags of concrete in the trunk. And the thing was amazing. It's like the joke was on me. So um, <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't daily drive my Mustang. Um, I work from home journalist here in South Dakota, so it might sit in the garage for you know a couple weeks at a time. But when the snow comes, instead of just getting a separate winter car, I just have my snow tires. And uh, you know I've got uh, I've got a few other go fast parts that are coming this week that I'll put on before the snow flies. But other than that, uh, I'm looking forward to going out and and having having some um, responsible fun on the roads. Responsible I, I, don't do, <laughs> I, I don't do anything illegal. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't expect me to come bail you out. Nope. All right. Uh, how about you, Anthony? What are you driving this week? Uh, actually, I haven't been driving much, but I have been spending time playing uh, Wreckfest. The new video game. All right, this is like the, the this is like the official uh, video game of Motor One. Uh, they are an advertiser, I will tell you that, which is why all of us happen to have a copy. But uh, none of us are being paid to play it. <laughs> we have just all gotten addicted to it. So what have what have you been doing? I've heard from uh, Smith about this game and from Bruce. Uh, what do you like about it? Uh, it's just ridiculous fun. There's no other point to the game. It's just to have fun. I mean, of course, it's a racing game, so the goal is to be first, obviously. But there's a lot of uh, insanity that can ensue between the uh, green flag and checkered flag. Uh, <laughs> that uh, is almost more fun than the racing itself. I mean, it's the the physics, the crash physics, and the destruction physics in this game are next level. Um, but- yeah, they're amazing. Playing games like Forza or even Gran Turismo, when you wreck, it's not, like, realistic. I mean, the car gets dented and damaged and the glass breaks, but it, it's not a an accurate uh, representation of a high-speed crash. Wreckfest, it's over-exaggerated. Um, the crumpling, the the way you can make get your car by the end of the race doesn't look like a car anymore. It's completely destroyed if you oh yeah if you do it the right way. <laughs> I'll tell you, I just I just got it this past weekend. I've just started playing it for the first time, and here's a couple things I've learned. Uh, I I started trying to win the races just like it was Forza or Gran Turismo. Like I was picking the line, I was trying to carry speed, and I quickly realized that is not how you win a race. You win a race. Like, if I'm coming into a corner, I don't try to, like, 
take that corner on my own and let the other car have its way. If I'm coming into a corner, I do like old school Gran Turismo and I hit them at full speed, peg them into the wall and hopefully bounce off and carry on. Uh, so like taking a line through a corner is like thrown out the window. It's, it's, I got to wreck that guy and get around him. And once, once I get in first place, then it's like Forza, then I'm doing my lines and I'm like really trying to, um, carry speed and have the lowest lap times. But in your, in your fight to claw from like, I think 11th place is usually where they start you at, like to fight from 11th place to first is is you you're causing mayhem i've learned i got to try to get to the inside corner as fast as possible um and when you take the inside you can pass like 10 people at a time um but but then the 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 the, usually the top three cars in a race are the ones that you kind of have to take out like you can't just you can't catch them on driving skill alone you got to get close and then just you know ram them off the road that sounds pretty accurate and not only uh, are, are there cars, but there's like combines and lawnmowers just to increase the the, the fun. Uh. <laughs> yeah, you guys are farther along than I am. I've I've got I've I've been able to drive the lawnmower once. Uh, I've not been able to drive a combine or a couch yet. Uh, and I, but I know that's in my future. Oh yeah, I always forget about the couch. I, I need to <laughs> I need to confess. Yeah, the, the the combine is just hilarious. <laughs> and the school it's, it's buses just, too, right? Yes, there there are school buses. I, uh, I I love racking up the combine as fast as it'll go, hitting somebody and watching them fly out of the cockpit. I, I'm morbid that way. I'll, I'll <laughs> One thing I'd like to do on Motor One is is because I know uh, the makers of Wreckfest, uh, they didn't use the licenses for the cards, so you can't. It doesn't say that this is a Ford or this is like an old Jaguar or something like that, but you can kind of tell. I want to do an article where we take every single car and reveal what car it's based on uh, and have them help us with that. Um, because I've, I'm constantly, like, some of them are obvious, but others I'm like, what is that supposed to be? And it's like on the tip of my tongue, but I can't figure it out. They're not all as obvious as Grand Theft Auto is sometimes. With uh... No, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But the graphics... The graphics are amazing, and you're you're right. the 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 crashing physics is over the top, but so fun to see what state your car is in at the end of the race. Um, so yeah, I'm honestly that's replacing uh, the cars I'm actually driving in real life too, as I've racked up a couple hours per day on it the last few days. All right, so you guys want to hear what I'm driving this week? It's actually something um, kind of special. I am driving a 2019 Mercedes AMG G63, uh, a Kardashian wagon, uh, as I like to call them. Uh, but honestly, I call them that as a joke. And this is my first time driving a G class of any kind, and my socks have been blown off. Um, this, it is such a strange vehicle. Um, you cannot compare it to almost, I don't think you can compare it to anything for one. Uh, this is the AMG model. It's $166,000, which is insanity. Um, when you open it, it's, it's like, like it, first of all, there's so many like weird things, concessions that it refuses to make to be a modern vehicle. Like the door handles are the old kind where you have to push a button and then open almost like an old Volkswagen, uh, which is just, it takes more effort and attention than just any old door handle. Um, and like the rear hatch doesn't, first of all, it opens to the side, not up and it's not automatic. Like you have to, again, open it just like the door. Um, it's shaped like, a, a vault, uh, you know, like a bank vault. I, it's, uh, the most unaerodynamic thing I've ever seen. Um, but you get in it and it rides like an S class. I don't know how they did that. Um, it's so solid. You, I, I was aiming for potholes and could barely feel them uh, at all. This, it, it like does it all. And of course, the engine is uh, Mercedes twin turbo four liter V8, uh, 577 horsepower here with 627 pound feet of torque. Uh, as much as this thing weighs, and it weighs uh, many tons, uh, it feels like it weighs nothing with this engine uh, that you've got. And the exhaust pipes come out uh, on the sides ahead of the rear wheels. It's, 
it's so strange. It's so strange a vehicle, but I, I absolutely love driving it. Um, I was joking with um, the guys at Inside EVs because uh, my wife uh, now drives a Tesla. And I was like, I don't know, guys, I really like the Tesla, but now I think I'm going to switch back to something that gets 12 miles per gallon combined because this thing is uh, one of the most incredible vehicles I've ever driven. What kind of response do you get from others on the road? Because you see those so rarely, at so, least where I'm at. <laughs> so I live in a suburb of Cleveland. That It's middle class, but I, I intentionally drove it through the upper class neighborhood yesterday, and I fit right <laughs> in. Uh, there were a couple Jags I passed. There was an Aston Martin. So I was covert there. I was just, you know, um, sliding behind enemy lines and seeing how the one percenters live. Um, I, I, so I haven't really taken it out and gotten, I think, reactions from people who wouldn't expect to see it. Um, I definitely got I, a few people jogging, like stared at it, um, cause it sticks out. It doesn't look like anything. And I, I, I truly believe most people have only see it in keeping up with the Kardashians probably, and they don't otherwise know anything about this vehicle. So, um, so far it's been somewhat stealth or at least it just raises an eyebrow and people go on about their day. Nothing like, like, uh, when I was driving the aforementioned, uh, McLaren, which, you know, practically, you know, caused a, a riot, any light I pulled up to with people staring and stopping and, and pointing and all of that. This one's a little bit more stealth. I will pay you $50 to put on a big brown wig and videotape yourself driving that around. <laughs> See if you can get a little bit of paparazzi going. Pretending to be a Kardashian. That's what I should It'll... do is hire people to be paparazzi for me. That's the trick. Viral video right there. That's the trick. I think that's what Kim did to get started. You just pay the paparazzi yourself <laughs> to make people think you're important. So just make it rain. <laughs> I will make it rain. All right. So that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at chwriting. Uh, you can follow Anthony at Anthony underscore Alaniz. Uh, that's A-L-A-N-I-Z. And you can follow me at John underscore M underscore Neff. I want to thank you two for being here on the show with me this week. Pleasure. It's been great. Awesome. And thank all of you uh, for listening. We'll see you next week.